Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started for the sake of time. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tego Bure, one of the graduate interns with the Right of Ways Habitat Working Group at the University of Illinois Chicago. And I'd like to thank you all for tuning into today's Mapping Cafe session, which will focus on prioritizing mapping of Chicago wildernesses built infrastructure. Next slide, please. Today, we hope to help you all, one, learn more about the Growing Chicago Habitat Initiative's prioritization strategy goal introduced at the last Mapping Cafe, create a space where land managers and GI specialists can come together and brainstorm ideas on what a prioritization strategy should be, and thirdly, to begin to frame what a useful prioritization strategy would look like. Next slide, please. So following this brief introduction to the Growing Chicago Habitat Initiative, we will hear from Victoria Wittig, who will give us a high level overview of the Calumet Region Conservation Plan. And then we will hear from Steve Barker and Dan Salas, who would discuss the prioritization cr criteria that NIPSCO used to identify certain areas for restoration, as well as NYSOURCE's newest effort to develop a biodiversity implementation strategy in pollinator habitat connectivity mapping with Cardinal Static. Mm -hmm. But we'll then break out into small groups to dive further into what this ideal prioritization strategy would look like and eventually share thoughts with a big group. Next slide, please. So Growing in Chicago is a recently formed initiative funded by the Donnelly Foundation and serves as a convening point for energy and transportation organizations, public and private landowners, and regional conservation partners to share information, build capacity, collaborate and track and showcase successes with Habitat projects. Our main goals are to establish a network that serves as a connection point between very managers, partner orgs and related initiatives across the Chicago region, use our shared platforms so organizations can tell their stories and build broader recognition and get support from internal and external stakeholders. And thirdly, to create a prioritization strategy building on existing mapping and prioritization efforts to identify areas for row habitat projects in the region. And this is particularly crucial because it serves as a means to support habitat creation and maintenance through logistical planning, land owning and public buying, long-term care and invasive species management. And I will pass it on to Iris now. Okay, thank you, Tega. Um, and hello, everyone. My name is Iris Caldwell. Uh, I work with Tega at the University of Illinois Chicago in the Energy Resources Center. Um, and as Tega mentioned, uh, we are leading this Growing Chicago Habitat Initiative. Um, and wanted to just take a moment before we get into um, some of the case studies that she um, highlighted. Um, again, just to take a step back and think about uh, the what we're talking about when we're talking about rights of way and other energy and transportation lands. Um, so this is just a snapshot of, um, again, the types of energy and transportation lands that uh, are crisscrossing our region, uh, electric transmission and distribution, uh, pipelines, railroads, highways, uh, local uh, County and, and uh, municipal streets as well, um, not to mention you know solar farms and other um, energy or transportation uh, locations that will be off um, located throughout the region. And this really vast network um, is really uh, oftentimes an overlooked landscape that we don't necessarily think of these as conservation lands. Um, but as we'll show here in the next couple of slides, there's some really important connectivity features um, that these lands can provide. They're managed landscapes, so there's opportunities to manage them for beneficial plants or for species in particular. Um, and so that's really the focus of this growing Chicago Habitat Initiative um, to look at opportunities for enhancing and maintaining um, habitat on these types of landscapes. And one way to, again, kind of think about this conservation value um, is these really cool graphics that were developed by the Friends of the Chicago River that I think do a really nice job of illustrating that connectivity piece that our rights of way, these linear roadsides, electric corridors, um, can serve as connectors for ha habitat hubs or other beneficial landscapes um, and green spaces across, um, across the region. So thinking about, again, that intersectionality, um, the connectivity, and simply just the scale 
um, of rights of way um, across the region. Um, we have worked with Mark Johnston um, at the Field Museum um, over the past several years to really look at the potential of rights of way uh, for habitat. And Mark was kind enough to pull together this analysis for us as we think about the, the potential of a prioritization strategy, promoting habitat um, on energy and transportation lands in the region. And so this first image is illustrating all major rights of way. So again, the transmission, uh, the roadsides, railroads, pipelines um, across uh, the region. And this is roughly 27,000 miles, again, of the major um, linear infrastructure um, across the region. If we look at those major rights of way that either cross or run adjacent or connect protected lands, um, this is a narrowed kind of scope um, of that connectivity across the region. And if I add another filter, we look at just those rights of way that are directly adjacent or on uh, protected lands. And then lastly, if we remove the protected lands themselves and we are just looking at the rights of way, um, this image captures, again, the, the significance or the scale of those rights of way across the region. Now, just looking at these lands that are adjacent or on protected lands, um, we're talking about uh, 1,800 miles um, of major rights of way across the Chicago region. That's roughly 7% um, of the total major right of ways um, that we showed in that first image. And roughly that's on the order of 23,000 acres. And again, that's just looking at the, the um, subset of rights of way that are on or immediately adjacent to those protected lands. So in the context of the habitat connectivity um, opportunity, as well as just, again, the vast scale that these lands represent, um, that's uh, part of the reason we're so interested in looking at these landscapes and developing tools to help right of way land managers um, better uh, strategize and prioritize where and how they're doing habitat um, on the landscape. So that brings us to this first project, um, which is creating a prioritization strategy for the region, uh, was one of those three goals that Tega mentioned early on. And how we plan to do this is um, first by recognizing, you know, what's the purpose of a prioritization strategy. Um, and this was identified as part of our strategic road mapping work that we did last year, also funded by the Donnelly Foundation and working closely with energy and transportation land managers and partners across the region. And what we heard was that having a decision support tool to help right-of-way managers and their partners make decisions around where and how to manage habitat on lands across the region um, would be exceptionally helpful. So we hope to do this by building on the great wealth of data um, that we know is out there. So we wanna utilize as many um, data points and existing conservation and prioritization plans as we can. We want to then focus on developing prioritization criteria that help us identify how we're going to prioritize certain areas across the region, and then work very closely with our stakeholders to then develop um, the specific strategies. So this is where the beginning of the process, um, and this cafe today is really helping us with some of the initial scoping. So again, we are very happy to have you all here and participating in this discussion. Um, and to help us really kind of get the, um, the momentum here in terms of what some of this prioritization strategies uh, can look like and what the potential is, um, we've asked for um, a couple of representatives in the region um, to provide uh, a little bit of their uh, background and, and stories on how they're using prioritization um, in a way that we might be able to build into this, uh, this uh, growing Chicago effort as well. So our first presenter, again, Victoria Wittig, um, I'll invite you to share a little bit about the Calumet Region Conservation Planning Effort. Thank you, Iris, and thank you everyone for joining in today's cafe. I am honored to be here to present some work that conservation partners in Northwest Indiana have been putting together for many, many years. 
Um, what I'm sharing today um, was largely driven by the Calumet Land Conservation Partnership, which is a partnership of the Field Museum, the National Park Conservation Association, Open Lands, Save the Dunes, Shirley Hines Land Trust, Audubon Great Lakes, um, and others. Um, in Northwest Indiana, there are a lot of what we call subgeographies or focus areas that have been the subject of partnership work. Um, and over time, the Calumet Land Conservation Partnership realized that utilizing a globally recognized tool called conservation action planning would enable partners working in all of these different areas to compare sort of apples to apples um, through this approach. And so I'm just going to um, provide a high level overview of a report that's come out of that effort. Um, this report will be released publicly in the next few months, um, but I'm, I'm glad to give you a, a high level overview today. Um, next slide, please. So there are eight subgeographies in the Calumet region where conservation partners have been hard at work for many years. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Indiana Dunes National Park or State Park, um, one of the most um, highly visited national park systems in, in the country. Um, but we also have these other gems in the region, including um, Ambler Flatwoods, the Moraine Complex near Valparaiso, Hoosier Prairie, the East and West Branch of the Little Calumet River, which are separate focus areas, Hobart Marsh and Deep River, which is connected to that area, and the heart of Calumet. Next slide, please. And so um, conservation action planning is a tool that conservation partners have utilized to identify conservation targets in each of those focus areas, what the threats to those targets are, and strategies to overcome them. Um, the conservation partners I mentioned from the Calumet Land Conservation Partnership is just one of many partnership groups. Um, I'm delighted that Steve is here today to, uh, for me to hand it over and talk about more of the actual uh, you know, prioritization work. Um, NIPSCO has been a very significant partner in all of these focus areas because of the rights of ways that run through them. Um, but we also um, work with um, parks and rec departments. For example, Lake County Parks and Recreation is a, a big partner. Um, the city of Gary is a big partner. Um, other municipalities across the region. Um, but within some of these focus areas, there are other partnership groups. So for example, in the ecosystems of the Indiana Dunes, um, there's the Indiana Dunes Ecosystem Alliance, which is um, led by Save the Dunes and the National Park Conservation Association and brings partners together on a regular basis to, identify, to talk about these conservation targets, the threats, the strategies, and build out work plans, grant funding um, opportunities, et cetera, to, to move ever closer to reaching their targets as more opportunities and, and threats arise. Um, but there are others. So um, today, next slide please. I'm gonna share um, a series of maps representing each of the eight focus areas in Northwest Indiana's part of the Calumet region. Um, I'll kindly note that there are two focus areas on the Illinois side of the Calumet that are also the subject of conservation action planning and Open Lands created a beautiful conservation action plan for the Illinois Little Calumet, which I believe is available on their website. But today uh, I'll focus in on the Northwest Indiana side of things. Next slide, please. And so this is just a, a bit of a zoomed in image of that map um, of the entire region and all the different focus areas. Um, can you see my cursor on the screen? No, nobody can see my cursor. Okay, um, well, so I'm gonna walk you from west to east. Um, so if you sort of, uh, so Iris, I think right now you're on the Calumet Conservation Compact, then they're above, to the right is the Illinois Little Calumet River. And then there's this wedged shape area um, called Heart of Calumet that crosses the state line, um, moving right along the Grand Calumet River and south is the west branch of the Little Calumet River. Below that is Hoosier Prairie and to the right, Hobart Marsh and Deep River. 
um, moving northward toward the shoreline, you see the um, Indiana Dunes ecosystems. Um, and that stretches um, right there where that cursor is. That's about where the Indiana Dunes State Park is. And then the National Park surrounds it. And then there are other park units um, further off to the west on the shore. Um, but below the, the dunes is the east branch of the Little Calumet River um, and all of its tributaries, one of which um, enters into the Moraine Complex, which is near Valparaiso. And then finally, in the upper right-hand corner um, is the Ambler Flatwoods focus area, and that um, tributary is Trail Creek. Um, next slide, please. And so what conservation partners have done in each of these focus areas is identify targets, threats, and strategies specific to the focus area. And what you're seeing here now is the heart of Calumet. Um, and so targets in the heart of Calumet embody um, natural areas and spaces connected to the Calumet wetlands and lakes, the Lake Michigan coastline, and remnant dune and swale habitat um, in both Illinois and Indiana. This particular area represents the complexity of partnerships because that you, we're working across state lines to identify common targets, threats, and strategies. Uh, next slide, please. The ecosystems of the Indiana dunes are um, the focus of a lot of conservation work, as you might imagine. They're also an anchor for conservation in Northwest Indiana. And you start to realize as you dig into these, these focus areas, they're all connected. And so the more work that goes on in one area benefits all of the adjacent areas. And so that maybe is something that the group would wanna talk about um, in breakout sessions. Um, and so here you see the ecosystems of the Indiana Dunes, and then you see this buffering sort of approach. And that's what the partners will use to indicate that although their focus is within particular management units, um, they're also always looking at what's on the border of those and how can they decrease um, fragmentation, increase connectivity. And a lot of that has to do with collaborating um, with working lands like NIPSCO's right of ways. Next slide, please. Here's a, a closer look at the East Branch of Little Calumet River. This is actually a conservation corridor um, led by Shirley Hines Land Trust. Um, you, they're taking a sort of watershed approach at this, at this stage in the game and actually bringing in agricultural lands um, in, into the fold. But then again, NIPSCO being such a significant partner is helping to identify areas in this landscape that NIPSCO can restore to enhance um, all of the existing natural areas and those that are being brought into conservation. Next slide, please. Um, here's a look at Hobart Marsh and Deep River. Um, you'll see there's lots of NIPSCO corridors highlighted here. Again, um, significant partner. Um, and I'm not sure if Steve will talk about it today, but uh, NIPSCO saved the dunes, National Park, um, Shirley Hines have an incredible Great Lakes restoration um, pollinator habitat grant and a lot of work, uh, incredible work is happening in, in this particular landscape. Next slide, please. Um, and then just to look at some of the others, Hoosier Prairie, um, next slide. Uh, Mer this is Moraine out south of Chesterton in Valparaiso area. Next slide. Um, the West Branch of the Little Calumet River. Uh, next slide. And Ambler Flatwoods. Next slide. Um, and so as I'm wrapping up, I just wanted to share a deeper dive. Um, what you are seeing are uh, the product of a lot of, of different documents, workshops, all kinds of information um, that's been pulled together in a report. Um, within the report, you'll see um, the maps. Um, credit is, is due to Joe Axel for creating them and all the partners that um, provided input to, to make sure they represented the landscape well. Um, but within each section um, for each focus area, then there's a deeper dive. So you start out with a look at the map, a description of the area, what the conservation vision and geographic scope is, which define where partners are focused. And then next slide, please. 
And we dig into the conservation target. So in the in ecosystems of the Indiana Dunes, the conservation targets are all found within particular management units. And so those management units then when the work is being done, work plans are being developed, grants are being written, they're looking at what needs to happen in each one of those management units to address their conservation targets. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's a, um, an overview of the conservation threats in this landscape. The threats are uh, common across the region in terms of invasive species, limited funding, um, uh, there's a lot of fragmentation, um, there's, you know, the need for prescribed fire, um, but then in some, some parts of the region, pollution and contamination of land and water is a big issue, or, you know, for example, in the dunes, shoreline erosion, um, climate change, human disturbances, um, and herbivore browse. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, and then there are the conservation strategies. And these are the real gems of conservation action plans because you know, identifying the targets and the threats is incredibly important. It's instrumental in, these, in this process. But the strategies are then what partners are doing when they're implementing new grants or projects or trying to build new partnerships or find another um, row manager to bring into the fold. For example, the Indiana Department of Transportation would be an incredible partner to have in the conversation to enhance all of the um, habitat restoration work that's going on in some of these areas. Next slide, please. And so that, that's all I have for today for the high level overview of conservation action planning in the Calumet region. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, I wanted to thank all of the partners that have been involved in this um, and also for Save the Dunes where I was formerly a staff member um, for all the support in getting these reports put together. Uh, Mark Bowman's been an incredible help. Um, Steve's been a help, folks at the park, Shirley Hines, all of them. So um, please look out for the report and um, thank you for the opportunity to share today. Great, thank you, Victoria. Uh, yeah, really helpful, again, to give a, a good example of a prioritization strategy um, in practice already in the region. Um, so I'm gonna next turn things over to Steve Barker uh, at NYSource and Dan Salas at Cardinal Downs Stantec um, to talk a little bit more specifically about what's happening uh, within NYSource. Great, Iris, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sure can. Okay, um, so again, I'm, I'm Steve Barker. I'm environmental principal at NYSource. More specifically, I manage a lot of environmental projects at, at NIPSCO, and most of my workload is in Northwest Indiana, which is where I, I live and been working for the past 20 years. So a lot going on. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, I thought Victoria really cued it up well. Um, for our prioritization and work we've been doing, you know, I've been here for about eight to nine years now, and it really originated with some of the work that was going on with the Indiana Dunes Ecosystem Alliance, which then evolved in, into a lot of this conservation action planning. So, you know, we're a company that our primary responsibility is safety and reliability for our customers. So, you know, giving, you know, sewer, electric and uh, natural gas supplier um, in Northern Indiana. Uh, so we have to meet those standards, of course, but then how do we partner with other organizations? I think this whole talk we're having today is about partnerships and how we can drive certain conservation measures forward. So really, you know, looking at those key uh, players and, uh, and partners to help drive some of the stuff that we're currently doing. Um, and so we, in Indiana, at least, we've been doing a lot of work on the ground um, prior to some of our sustainability reporting, but now this ties in directly to how we report on ESG, um, whether it's Dow and Jones Sustainability Index or some of the other indices that are out there. So there's a lot of great work, but now we're in the process of really bringing that all together to come up with um, better prioritization and then biodiversity metrics. Next slide, please. So if you want to know more information, we'll be developing this website further over this next year, but our commitment is online. You can actually see some of the Indiana projects we've been working on over the last several years uh, right at this link. Next slide. Um, you know, our, our biodiversity reporting, we're, we're developing the framework right now. You can kind of see 
how we operate in, in Northern Indiana. Uh, there's a great focus in Northwest Indiana where we have a lot of shared uh, natural gas and electric transmission rights of way. Um, DGASI, Dow Jones, Sustainability Index, you know, we first started reporting on biodiversity in 2018, which is a big thing. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks are looking at biodiversity as, as a key metric in, in reporting. Next slide. And so really it's looking at how we provide connectivity. Um, we've already discussed that. And then so really having an under, understanding of our footprint I think is really important and then how we can work with adjacent land, man, land managers on, uh, on resources. Next slide. Um, and then looking at some of our goals, of course, how they're gonna be changing over time. Um, Post-construction 2022 go goals are you know, being finalized by the Convention of, on Biological Diversity, for example. So we're looking at how we can develop better quantification, how we can better track uh, not only prioritization where we do current activities and conservation activities, but how do we track biodiversity over time? Um, and then I'm probably going to kick this over to Dan on this next slide. Go ahead, Dan. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, so I guess kind of building on some of that that Steve was just describing, right? Uh, as we think about prioritization and focus for, for NISORS, we've been going through this effort to develop this strategy that Tega mentioned at the, at the beginning. And it's really taking that commitment that's in place and thinking about from a, a business standpoint within NISource, how do we think about biodiversity um, and all the species and you know, protect areas that we're thinking about and talking about in terms of prioritization regionally, and then boil that down into targets, actions, and metrics uh, for the company to sort of direct their efforts uh, you know, strategically. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, so one aspect of this, maybe a little bit different, you know, as we think about sort of conservation uh, priorities is then looking at that lens from a business perspective and where does biodiversity pose risks or add value to operations that NISORS specifically has. And so we've gone through sort of this brainstorming exercise to identify where there's risks. There's different type of types of risks as shown in that table on the left there. Uh, but there's also values that are provided by biodiversity. These are you know business values. So not even just species or uh, you know sort of uh, the, the conservation values that we all can agree on, but you know, where is there actually um, like business additions or values provided um, through biodiversity? Biodiversity often underpins a lot of those ecosystem services that we rely on for uh, reliability, for safety, for a lot of things. And so um, spelling that out so we can communicate that uh, both in and outside the company is really important. If you go to the next slide, and I think for an ISO source, this is a really important. And as we think about how, how you know, a company like that would use uh, you know, a regional prioritization framework is really the intersection of both of those, right? So we're looking at where, uh, as Steve said, you know, the first responsibility is to deliver, you know, safe and reliable power um, and other services. How, how do we sort of overlay that with those conservation needs and, and do that in a thoughtful way, in a way that, um, you know, puts the focus, the attention where it sort of brings the both, most conservation benefit both on the ground for those conservation needs, but also for the company. And so we've been, been looking at some of these, you know, different mapping layers that we're talking about here, kind of in light of that and folding that into the decision-making there. If you go to the next slide, uh, this kind of shows how that scaled process goes and how these different sort of aspects fit into this. All right, there, there's all sorts of, you know, even global national data sets regarding land cover, uh, threatened species, important biodiversity areas, of course, there's all the regional layers that we're talking about here, um, as well as some of the great partnerships that have been described already um, in the session today, and some of the mapping that's coming out of efforts like, like this in the working group here. Um, and then using that in addition with other, you know, again, the company specific data to then boil down into site specific plans, where then we put these into action on the ground. We have, again, those targets, those metrics, and those actions associated with that. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, just to Briefly highlight, you know, for, for nice sources purposes, we're really boiling these down into sort of three focus areas or three goals. Uh, one is having a net zero loss in terms of biodiversity. Uh, the second being that we actually want to get to a net gain, so we can actually turn the tide and and uh, you know have positive gains. And last, making that connection back to the community aspect, right? That um, a lot of those underpinning values that uh, nice source you know benefits from, also communities benefit from, and so sharing that story. Um, so people can understand that and hopefully connect with nature in that way as well. 
and ultimately bring that down to, again, it goes back to the on the ground action. So having specific locations where we can, uh, you know, implement actions, demonstrate and, and share that story of, of sort of where we're having those benefits. And uh, Steve, I don't know if you want to share any specifics on, on this example here to illustrate that. Yeah, this is one of our primary rights of way that either goes through or is directly adjacent to the national park, uh, the Coles Bog unit. Um, and so this is one where not only is it directly adjacent, but it also has fairly diverse plant communities in, in addition to, you know, uh, animals that are out there as well. So this, this, is, this was identified as a priority via, from the IDEA group, the Indiana Dunes Ecosystem Alliance. And so we have since been prioritizing certain conservation measures, including increasing plant diversity and pollinator habitat along this right of way. So again, that this came out of the need. I mean, this, this right of way has been here for a long time. It's always been a, a resource that's been identified by environmental stakeholders, but now we've kind of elevated it within the company to further manage it and then um, restore it, enhance it, so forth and so on. Great. Mute it there. Um, thank you both, uh, Steve and Dan. Um, I know you had a, a very short time window uh, to present a lot of information, but um, I think you did a really nice job uh, laying the groundwork and again, showing some specific examples of how a prioritization strategy is currently being used and, and could be used regionally as well. Um, so we are uh, gonna set up some uh, small group breakout discussions. And again, um, I know we've had a couple of people joining us um, here as we've been moving through the cafe. So just to a quick refresher back to what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so the goal of developing a prioritization strategy for rights of way, um, again, is to create a decision support tool that both right of way managers and partners can use to help guide decisions around habitat conservation on energy and transportation lands. Um, the steps that we plan to go through um, in this process are collecting um, existing mapping data and plans that can inform uh, a prioritization uh, strategy or model, identifying the criteria that we want to use for prioritization, and I'm listing some of the examples and initial work that we've done to start to think about what might be included um, below the, the graphic there. And then, of course, engaging diverse stakeholders in the actual development of the strategy to help us identify some common focus areas, um, some criteria, um, potentially collaborative projects, and a more holistic approach towards um, maximizing that ecological and, and social benefit. Um, so with that in mind, um, I, we're going to be going into breakout discussions to have you help us think a little bit more about the what, the why, and the how of this prioritization strategy. And we're really interested in hearing from you all um, in terms of how you envision being able to use a strategy like this and what it looks like to you. Um, we're in the early stages. We're very interested in how different organizations and individuals might utilize um, a prioritization strategy like this and what form it should take. Um, are we talking exclusively a set of maps? Are we talking something that's maybe not so spatial and more a prioritization criteria or something in between like some of the examples that are shown here um, on the slide? Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Tega to introduce our uh, discussion questions, and then we'll all be sent off um, into our discussion groups for about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll come back for a, a wrap up. Okay, so uh, thank you, Iris. And as Iris just mentioned, um, we're going to break out into five groups and have 15 minutes to discuss those questions, and each room will have a facilitator to assist with today's discussion. So the conversations we fra will be framed based on these questions. What would an ideal road prioritization strategy look like? And what does it do? And the second uh, would be what resources or data do you have to share or contribute to the development of this road prioritization strategy that we're trying to create now? And I think we're everyone. Um, I know if your session was like mine, uh, that was a lightning round, um, but hopefully you had a chance to share some initial thoughts um, and ideas, and we'll be aggregating um, all those notes from the different breakout groups. I um, want to take just a moment here uh, before we wrap up for the day, um, just to have um, a couple of quick um, rounds from the breakout groups. So I'm going to call on each of the breakout group leaders for maybe a, a 30 second um, summary of a, a key thought or theme that came out of your discussion. 
Um, and why don't I start with group one? Is that you, Caroline? Yeah, me. Um, fantastic discussion. It was really invigorating. But um, just a, a quick overall thing that I thought was really neat was we talked about how we can take the priorities because everyone using this prioritization strategy is probably coming from a different angle and interest point. So how we can take that um, and use it as a filter or something like that. But also on the other end, what information um, we would need to consider when we're thinking about these areas. So um, what is the, the current habitat like? Um, is there, um, you know, is it a hundred year flood zone? So any kind of information that we can also gather from that area that we're gonna then prioritize. So we're kind of looking at it from both ends of the, the spectrum. Okay, great, thanks Caroline. Uh, Tega, group two. Yeah, so just thinking about what the ideal prioritization strategy would look like, we've talked about having a defined geographic scope, so thinking in terms of mapping to help understand the landscape to work in, and from there building out a vision for what goals the strategy is trying to achieve. We also discussed a prioritization strategy being developed in terms of community voices, so thinking about prioritizing rural habitats and, and thinking about safety restrictions and what people think about that specifically. And we talked about the barriers that might potentially affect this and the very there was a general consensus that it was it all came down to funding. So lack of funding has really affected this whole um, trying to grow a habitat to create that prioritization strategy that being trying to develop. Great, thanks, Tega. Um, I was group three. Um, we talked a bit about um, some of the different considerations that we would want included in uh, a prioritization strategy. Um, one of the ones that jumped out to me as, as being uh, worth mentioning is recognizing that um, a lot of these potential sites that we're looking at for habitat may be unknown gems, uh, was the term that was used, um, either to the right-of-way manager, maybe they don't realize what they have um, and what they're managing, but also to the community. And so being able to highlight these gems um, for different stakeholders uh, to maybe focus efforts um, was a, a, a neat idea that, that came out of our discussion today. Um, next, group four, uh, was that you, Mark? Yeah, that's me. I was muted, I guess. Um, oh, and my notes just disappeared. Great. Okay, well, I was going to say that we were working at um, really talking about a number of scales. Um, so I think that's one thing we can contribute that's different from what folks have said, is that the prioritization can really happen kind of at a zoomed out scale and also at the very specific sort of parcel by parcel. And how do we do that with, you know, as we develop a tool, how do we not be too prescribed where we're talking about the really specific minute parcels but also looking at zooming out and thinking about the larger scale of like how we're connecting areas together we talked a lot about connectivity in the presentations but um how do we develop a tool that helps to 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 look at that more general aspect um we really liked with the presentation in the northwest indiana how that was kind of done and there is some some sort of general sense to that protection areas but then also these these corridors um that are connecting they could both act as um areas for invasives to travel through as well as uh, wildlife if it's higher quality um and then we tried to dip into some of the data and tools um but I uh, didn't get too far, but uh, certainly there is data out there. ComEd has data to share already um, that was brought up in our group. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and lastly, Ted, what came out in your group? Yeah, we had an interesting group that kind of uh, counteracted Tega's and Mark's findings a little bit. Um, we were primarily uh, uh, eco-focused with not a whole lot, a lot of utility folks uh, with high specialization in pollinators. Um, so our group thought that uh, maps were not as helpful as general clear cut vision documents with mapped out the steps of who to contact how to go about this, breaking down some of the bureaucracies um, that are barriers. Uh, and then um, the other question was uh, sort of about resources. And, and I did a big plug for the CW Hub because um, 
my group didn't know that existed, uh, but they also, so basically the, the resources were coming from us to them, which I thought was really interesting, especially given sort of the, the narrative form that our discussion was taking, if that helps. Okay. Okay, that is, yeah, it highlights the different perspectives um, coming yeah. into this conversation. So thanks, Ted. Um, we have just two minutes uh, left here of our, our hour time frame, so we're going to zip through um, some next steps, and I'll turn it back to Tega to wrap things up. Wonderful. So thank you all again for tuning in and thinking about next steps. There are a few things we would like to highlight. So please keep an eye out for our post-meeting questionnaire. A follow-up will be sent before the end of next week with the video recording of today's session, so you can always rewatch that. Um, keep an eye out for upcoming cafe sessions. We're looking to have one or two more either in the late summer or in the fall to refine the scope for this prioritization strategy. And if you're not part of the Growing Chicago initiative yet and you're interested in being a part, you can head up to our website and click on the Get Involved section and it, you'll be taken into this um, survey or questionnaire where you can just express your interest and we can add you to the share platform and our discussion board and just jumping to the end. Yes, thank you all again for attending. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We look forward to continuing our partnership to grow Chicago with you all. Thank you very much for listening. Bye. Thank you everyone.